Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for being here this evening. Um, we're here to welcome Luis Carlos Montalvan and his beautiful service dog, Tuesday. Uh, Luis and Tuesday are here with us on Nantucket for the better part of 10 days now, um, hosted by Holidays for Heroes and the good folks at the Westmore Club. Um, there was an event at the Westmore Club last Sunday evening to a crowd of about 200 people to launch the new Service Dogs for Heroes campaign with a goal of streamlining the um, possibilities for veterans who need a service dog to be matched up with an appropriately trained and skilled dog. Um, Brooke was kind enough to organize this meeting for all of you tonight. It means so much to us that the first responder community on Nantucket is a part of this really important launch. Um, so we all think of service dogs as guide dogs, helping people who um, are unsighted. But service dogs do so much more. And in recent years, we're learning that they can be wonderfully effective um, companions to uh, work with people who have PTSD. So um, with that, I will thank you for being here and introduce Luis. After the presentation, there'll be a question and answer. And then after that, we have three of Luis's books to sign. The first one, which is Until Tuesday, the story of a wounded warrior and the dog who saved or changed his life. And then subsequent to that release, which was a New York Times bestseller, and I believe it's in eight languages, uh, Luis published two children's books, Tuesday Tucks Me In and Tuesday Takes Me There. And they're all just delightful books for young and old. So with that, um, we'll give you Tuesday and Lewis. Thank you very much. Well, special thanks to Lynn Walsh, Miss Lynn Walsh, and to Miss Brooke Maxwell for uh, hosting us and putting on this lovely event. Um, we're going to talk today about, about a couple of topics, uh, including post-traumatic stress disorder and service dogs, as it relates to how, what, what sorts of things first responders need to know. Um, we would be remiss Tuesday, my beloved service dog. We'd be remiss if we did not uh, thank and thank you all and Nantucket for hosting us, as well as a number of other military veterans and their families, for this week's uh, Holidays for Heroes uh, programs. It's really an honor and a pleasure to, to spend some time on your beautiful island, getting to know you um, and your community. Uh, it's just, I can't tell you how, how gracious it is to uh, be welcomed in the ways that we have been. So thank you all. Um, we want to also acknowledge our first responders, uh, including uh, a Deputy Chief Ed Maxwell, retired, uh, who was with uh, Nantucket's Fire Department for 25 years, recently retiring in April, and, uh, and, and who is uh, the other half of, of our hostess here, uh, Brooke Maxwell, who, by the way, has a, an amazing doggy daycare called Cozy Canines. Um, and if you need, are in need of phenomenal daycare and dog walking, please look to your neighbor here uh, for, for, for those services. So um, I spent 17 years in the Army. Uh, got out uh, in 2007. Uh, in, my, in my military service, I was a communications specialist, a military police officer, an infantryman, and then ultimately an armor cavalry officer. Um, I exited uh, a captain, though I had been enlisted for uh, many years in the Army. And it was truly an honor to serve our country and, and partake in its important mission that continues. However, it was difficult. It was a very difficult thing. Um, uh, the, the, for me, the, the tours in the Middle 
activities, the combat, um, as well as the peacetime training. Um, and I'm here. Enforce it and just because, call for your removal. Uh, because, uh, well, in, in large measure, because I was wounded. And in that recovery process, I had the, the blessed fortune of being partnered with this beautiful golden retriever service dog named Tuesday. That happened in 2008, and we've been together for about eight years. Tuesday had two years of training, two years and two months of training prior to uh, our becoming partners. And that's a lot of school for a dog, two years and two months. Imagine if we, if we use the, the equation of seven years, right, human, uh, d dog to human years, if we, if we think that one human year is seven of their years, that would be more than 14 years of his life, right? Uh, um, uh, in training to ultimately partner with a human. And that tends to be the standard. Two years for a service dog. In the case of, of guide dogs, which do help people with vision impairment, that would be three years. Uh, but most service dogs go through two years of training, and that's important because what they do is remarkable. And you're going to see some of that later because Tuesday is going to demonstrate some of his amazing skills and tricks uh, because they're fun tricks too. But there are lots of skills that help uh, me with my disabilities. So what we're going to do is talk a little bit about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder, um, some considerations for first responders, uh, namely fire, EMS, paramedics, um, uh, even broadly speaking, uh, even here on Nantucket, right? We have Coast Guards, men and women, we have uh, police, we have, um, you know, lots of interagency response to various uh, calamities, and that's important. So we'll talk about some of those, the, the, the considerations that first responders uh, should, should think about as it relates to both people with mental health conditions such as PTSD and uh, those with service dogs. And then ultimately we will take, we'll do some cute question and questions, we'll take some questions and, and, uh, and, and, and look forward to a discussion with you about subjects of relating to this, the, these subjects. And then um, we'll demonstrate some of the ways that Tuesday takes care of me and how service dogs can help some people with, with so many different disabilities, physical, mental, psychological, so on. Let's see. So well, here we are, this first slide. We're here, August 10th, right? And, and uh, I didn't come up with the title. Uh, I think Brooke and the first responders of Nantucket came up with this clever title, A Salute to Tuesday, which... Uh, why service dogs matter. And I thought that was kind of special. That was a really honor, honorable thing to, to do. And, um, and just so that you know, and I know that uh, Lynn is going to touch, touch uh, on this toward the end, in case you're interested, uh, this Saturday and Sunday, those are the right days, right? Saturday and Sunday, the 13th and 14th, there are some amazing events that you can come and participate uh, in with your animals if you so desire. And of course, we would love to see you and your friends for that. Um, next slide, please, Brooke. So this is a salute to Tuesday. Why service dogs matter? Why do they matter? Boy. Now, how many of you, just out of curiosity, how many of you have dogs? Would you raise your hands? Gosh, that's almost all of you. And that's fantastic. We love our dogs. We love our dogs. They're our family, but there's so much more, and, and we're going to touch on that too. Next slide. So again, just to, just to let you know, we're going to touch on post-traumatic stress disorder, the effects of PTSD, service dogs, how service dogs change lives, service dog considerations for first responders, and a question and answer period. Tuesday, oh, you want to go underneath the... You want to go underneath the desk because, you know, they're den, they're den animals, right? They, want, they like a nice little cover. But that's okay. Tuesday, come here. Side. Good boy. Next slide, please, Brooke. Thank you. 
It's just a happy slide, right? Why are we here? We're here to discuss these things. Uh, and as Nelson Mandela said in that powerful quote, education is, is just about everything. We need to better prepare ourselves for the challenges ahead. And so we're, we're honored to spend some time with you talking about these subjects. Next slide, please. What is post-traumatic stress disorder? Most of you have heard of PTSD. You know what that, you, you may not understand exactly what post-traumatic stress disorder is because you may not have it and or you just may not know it because it's, but you have surely heard of PTSD by now. And thankfully that's, that's due to, in large measure, these contemporary wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, if we can look for silver linings, I think certainly one silver lining in the 21st century as a result of these conflicts is certainly that people understand they have heard of PTSD, that PTSD is now a household term. And that's good. And, and in so doing, by the way, mental health in the 21st century has now elevated in importance. Um, I, think, I think it's important that we um, take stock in the good things, right? Like the fact that mental health is now, and ever, ever more so, raising the level of discussion in candid ways. For too long, for too many years, people suffered in silence, largely, about conditions that are, in actuality, normal. Normal. It's not abnormal to experience mental health conditions. It, in fact, is normal. That's not to say that everyone will be diagnosed with a mental health condition, but without question, in our lives, we all are faced with challenges that test us uh, psychologically. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a mental health condition that's triggered by a terrifying event, either experiencing it or witnessing it. Symptoms may include flashbacks, nightmares, severe anxiety, as well as uncontrollable thoughts about the event. Now, as Tuesday and I see it, and by the way, every, when I say we, I'm talking about the royal furry we. <laughs> that's Tuesday and me. Uh, so if you think I'm a little bit nuts, well, that's okay because I happen to know you all are, most of you are dog people, and you're just as nuts as I am. <laughs> so the royal furry we is, when, when I say we, there isn't, I mean, I, I'm sure I have invisible friends, but I don't, I'm not referring to any invisible friends. I'm referring to Tuesday when I say we. Um, something that I think is, that we think is a reality, and we don't mean to say this in a negative way. We mean to say it in a pragmatic, matter-of-fact way. Life is beautiful. Life is full of laughter and love and happiness and joy and peace and light and lots of good things. But there is also sadness and pain and darkness. And we have to, and, that, and that's a reality. That's just a part of the journey. Um, I think it's important that we acknowledge that and that we acknowledge that sometimes trauma, traumatic events happen. And trauma can be anything from a divorce to a disease to the passing of someone we love and that someone could be furry. That someone could be furry as much as it could be human. It could be the trauma of a crime. It could be the trauma of, of war. It could be the trauma of a natural disaster, an earthquake or a hurricane. There are lots of different traumas that, that, that we are touched by in our lives. And again, that's not... I don't think that's a negative thing to dwell on. I think it's important that we face that, that we talk about it in this way when we're fine. 
rather than when it happens. Because when it happens, it's very difficult to talk about it objectively. It's very difficult to think about things in healthy, productive ways when we're in that situation, when we're in that trauma. But, we, but traumas are a part of life. As much a part of life as love and family and hope and light and gatherings like these. If we understand that traumatic events happen, then I think we can better deal with them when they happen. And that's important for us all to, to I think, really digest, right? We need to, we, what can we do and what happens when difficult challenges uh, are, are in front of us? First responders deal with that every day. First responders deal with traumatic events every day. I mean, Tuesday and I have only been here less than three days. We've only been here a few days. But already we have seen first responders react on our way. Uh, a, a, a new friend drove, was driving us through town and we saw a Jeep uh, with, the, with the sirens going, reacting to a, some trauma. I don't know what that trauma was, but if those sirens are going, they're responding to a trauma. And thank God, they're there to help us out. But they, they look at trauma, they see trauma every day of all kinds, of all kinds. Um, and and, uh, and that's a difficult, that's a diff very difficult job. It's why we honor them the way we do, because they deal with things every day that we only experience but a few times in our life. Next slide, please, Beth. I mean, Brooke. Just one fact, one factoid for you to consider. Um, and it, again, don't mean it to be distressing or depressing. But nearly one in every five people, or 42 and a half million American adults, has a diagnosable mental health condition. Half of all lifetime cases of mental disorders begin by age 14. One in five. That's a lot. That's not something to shrug your shoulders at. Um, again, that's not a negative thing. That it's just a thing. It just is. But it's nonetheless, it's important for us to understand our situation so that we can be compassionate and so that in this case, first responders can act and react appropriately. Um, for, for first responders who were watching this video and who are here. It's important, and, and most first responders are trained in this. But part of this, the reason for this discussion, this, uh, this hour we're spending with you, is to, is, to, is to highlight some considerations. First responders, it's important, it's essential that first responders really be cool and collected, right? I mean, because they are reacting, they're, they're showing up at places where emotions are high, pain exists, people are crying, people are upset, there could be seriously injured people. And in order to deal with those situations in the best possible manner, you have to be calm, you have to be collected. First responders train for that, but mostly it's by doing that they become resilient, that they become capable of reacting to things in a cool and collected way. Next slide, please. What are the effects of PTSD, of post-traumatic stress disorder? There are many effects of post-traumatic stress disorder, more than could ever be put up on any slideshow. And I don't mean to even focus on the symptoms of PTSD, which are different. That's a medical, those are, they're medical symptoms. These are some of the most common, you know, the effects of PTSD, bigger than the symptoms of PTSD. The effects of PTSD touch every area of an individual's life. 
the longer that PTSD exists without treatment, the greater the effects of PTSD on a person's life. Now, I have post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, when I came home from war, I well, and even in war, I experienced symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's different for each person. We all don't respond to anything the same. I mean, with regard to anything. If a loud noise all of a sudden happened right now, each of us would react differently. Each person in this room would react differently. Some would do nothing. Some would just turn their head. Some would stand up. Some would duck. Some would maybe be alarmed. Each of us would react differently. And that's fine. That's just a natural uh, individual's reaction. With post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, it's not as though, typically, again, but it, it differs from person to person, typically, it, things don't just happen right away. So if something bad happens, it's not necessarily the case that you instantaneously are unable to do certain things or are instantaneously affected. You may not be just emotionally distraught, emotionally impaired, you know, the day after or the day of, and so on. There, is, there are misconceptions that exist that to have post-traumatic stress disorder means that instantaneously you have to be affected or messed up or something along those lines. When in reality, these things manifest, these things happen over time. They can get worse, they can get better. Some people get certain symptoms, some people get other symptoms, some people have some symptoms at a given time, and others at another time. Some, and by the way, post, again, post-traumatic stress disorder is not unique to war veterans, combat veterans, first responders, those who react to traumatic events every day can develop, we have many friends who have post-traumatic stress disorder, who are first who are police, fire, paramedics, EMTs, uh, even medical personnel, I mean, who are too responding to traumatic events day in and day out. Uh, but as, as Tuesday and I mentioned a little while ago, you could, something could happen to you in life. A trauma could happen. And you might, it doesn't mean you're going to develop post-traumatic stress. But usually, a traumatic experience will affect you in some way. But it doesn't have to be war. A lot of people are, nowadays, they think, well, they think of PTSD, they think of a war veteran. And I, I, there, there's some truth to that, but not, certainly not every war veteran has post-traumatic stress disorder. And certainly not every firemen, police officer, doctor, nurse, and so on have post-traumatic stress disorder. It just, it just depends. But there are plenty of people who are not first responders who have post-traumatic stress disorder. Next slide, please, Brooke. So what are the, some of the most common effects of PTSD? Again, some of the most common. Uh, as, as Tuesday and I mentioned, there are, there are trauma can affect people differently. And it can cause some people to eat less or more and to develop medical conditions relating to eating. It can, a person can develop some, sort, some degree of paranoia. And most of you know what paranoia means. It's a fear, kind of a constant fear. Difficulty with regulating emotions. When I, when I came home, and again, it wasn't instantaneous. It wasn't like a light switch that somebody turned on and all of a sudden I was upset. Um, and it wasn't always the same either. But there were occasions when I, when I went out, I felt nervous. Things, noises, a certain, a certain smell or someone could resemble something that I experienced in war that may cause a memory to come forward that may make me nervous. 
even though I knew that I was not in the Middle East, even though I knew I was, this person was not that person, even though I knew that that sound wasn't exactly the, that sound wasn't a gun, that sound was a, the car backfiring. Your body can be affected in such a way that you can get nervous. You can get what's called panic attacks. Your heart can start beating very fast and you can get very nervous and stressed out and start sweating and, and, and it's difficult to deal with. Inability to maintain stable relationships. Well, you know, something that I've noticed, and Tuesday and I in our travels advocating for people with disabilities, um, and in discussing trauma, trauma, a painful experience, um, trauma can really affect a person's ability to trust. Something happens, uh, let's say a man or a woman gets assaulted in the park. Some bad person assaults that person. Well, that man or woman may not trust going to that park for a while or ever. They may start to lose trust in themselves. Oh my gosh, I can't trust myself to react a certain way. I should have called the police. I should have gotten out of there. I shouldn't have, I should have known better than to walk that way. Or a person gets cancer and maybe they, they die. And, and a family member may say, well, gosh, this was so painful. Was I responsible in some way? What if I had told him or her to go to the doctor and get help more? What if I, I could have done something? I may not, that person may not trust him or herself in the same way. Trauma has an amazing way of making a person's ability to trust very difficult. And trust is everything. Trust is everything. Right now, I trust, we're all trusting that this building will stay on. The electricity will stay on. And I trusted, Tuesday and I trusted that Lynn would be here and Brooke would be here and all of us here in the Nantucket community trusted that this uh, police officer would take care of us and that the fire department would take care of us and I trusted that Tuesday would take care of me and help me here we are constantly, trust is, it runs through everything. We all need trust to live and be happy. So when a trauma happens and we are, our, our ability to trust is affected, it's very powerful. It can be very powerful. So in maintaining a stable relationship, you know, sometimes relationships, married relationships, friendships, relationships with all kinds of things, even God sometimes. Sometimes something bad happens and we question and we doubt and we ask why and we can't think straight because our trust has been affected. And that's not unnatural, that's natural. because that pain affected us. Disassociative symptoms, boy, that's kind of a big term. Uh, but what that means is that you have a hard time connecting with people. You may not want to go to the, uh, the government building at six o'clock on Wednesday evening because you just feel disconnected. You don't want to associate with other people because you're you may be depressed or angry. And again, when, when this list here, this is not unnatural and it's not bad. You know, we tend to think of anger and depression and nightmares as bad. And of course, it's not happy and it's not welcome, but it's not bad. 
it's the way it happens. It is a reality. It's important that we, I think, understand that these things are natural. They're not exactly where we want to be, but they're natural. They're not bad. And there is a difference there. We tend to think, oh, well, if someone's angry, I shouldn't be ang they shouldn't be angry because that's bad. But when you look at Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief, anger is right in there. And that's natural. That's natural. In fact, it's kind of good to go through these emotions in a, in a productive way. Because if we don't, then we bottle up all these things. And then we, as, as that slide said, we never get through. We never get, we never heal. We never get to a better place. We bottle up these things for so many years. Some people spend a lifetime bottling up these things. And they can never really be happy and thrive in the way that they should and want to. They're nightmares. One of the things that I had to deal with, and it started in Iraq, in the war. I had to deal with very bad nightmares. One of the things that Tuesday has helped me do, and it's a beautiful thing. I thank him all the time, hundreds of times a day I thank Tuesday. But I had a terrible time sleeping, terrible time. I would go to sleep for two hours and I couldn't stay asleep. And you know when you can't sleep, that's pretty awful. When you can't sleep, you feel tired the next day, you almost can't do anything because you're so tired. But Tuesday, now I have no pro almost no problem sleeping because Tuesday, who I can trust and who's there, he tucks me in, which is one of the titles of our book. He makes me feel secure. He makes me feel peaceful and happy and loved. And I can trust him. And so now I have very little problem sleeping. Guilt and sleep problems and substance abuse, gosh, I and I'll say this with an open heart. And I say it with an open heart because too many people in this country and even in the world, bad things happen, trauma happens, difficult things happen, painful things happen, and they start to drink and do drugs. And I understand why that happens. I started to drink, not because I wanted to be drunk, but because I had a hard time sleeping and because I had a lot of pain and I wanted to numb the pain, anything I could do to numb the pain. And that was very bad. It was very painful for me, and it was painful to others. Um, thankfully, I don't, you know, that's not the case anymore. But too many people turn to alcohol and drugs when traumatic events, when painful things happen, and it only masks the pain. It only temporarily gives them a source of comfort. It isn't real. And the longer you go with that mask, the harder it gets to break free. Difficulty maintaining a job, agoraphobia. I had a terrible case of agoraphobia. Agoraphobia is a big word, meaning basically that you have a hard time going out. You, are, you have a phobia, a fear, of places and people. And that's terrible because life is all about connecting. Tuesday and I wanted to come and meet you. And you wanted to come and meet us and, and each other and spend some time together. If you can't connect with other people, furry and, not, and less furry, <laughs> if, you, if we can't connect with each other, gosh, that's not fun. That's not a fun life. So agoraphobia is terrible. You don't want to be locked in your home, especially in a, such a beautiful place like Nantucket. You want to go to the beach, and you want to go to the pool, and you want to go uh, into town, and you want to do all kinds of, we all, and we all want to do all kinds of stuff. That's part of the beauty of life. So when you're not able to do that, that's pretty terrible. Next slide. Comfort. I threw that slide on there because after we talk about the effects, some of the major effects of PTSD, right? What's sort of the soothing balm, right? How do we, 
you know, what is the opposite of, of that in some ways? Being comforted, right? A state in the, the, the Merriam-Webster dictionary, a state or situation in which you are relaxed and do not have any physically unpleasant feelings caused by pain, heat, cold, etc. Another definition, a state or feeling of being less worried, upset, frightened during a time of trouble or emotional pain, and a person or thing that makes someone feel less worried, upset, frightened, etc. We all need to be comforted. We all need comfort in our lives, whether we have PTSD or not. Right now, I see beautiful examples of comfort. Right now, Tuesday is comforting. He's on my foot. He's sleeping on, he's resting on my foot. And that brings me comfort. And this beautiful lady and her girl are comforting each other, cozy and comfortable like this. And you all are sitting next to each other, almost chill elbow to elbow. We all want to be comforted. We all want to be comfortable. It makes life that much sweeter. And it brings, it brings a, a sense of peace when uh, we feel less than OK. Next slide, Brooke, thank you. Just a happy slide. Segue. The light shines, and there's so much light. There is so much light. Even I, 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 Tuesday and I take great comfort and pleasure in knowing that even in the darkness, right? Space, the universe is a dark place, but stars like the sun and the stars we see at night illuminate the darkness. Even the smallest of lights pe penetrates the darkness. And that's special and beautiful. You can't, you can't extinguish that. Next slide. How service dogs change lives. So what is a service dog? A service dog is a dog that's highly trained to perform tasks that would help a person with disabilities live their life specially trained to perform tasks, and we'll demonstrate some of them, that can help a person with all kinds of things, including blindness, deafness, psychological conditions, physical conditions, could be diabetes and epilepsy, things you can't see, things you can see, visible and invisible, physical and mental. There's very little in this world that can't be made better to some degree, including with our, our bestest of friends, dogs. They make our lives so much greater. Service dogs, like Tuesday, can do more things than anyone could, could write about or tell you in any conversation. They're that effective. Next slide. We become what we think about all day long. Ralph Waldo Emerson. And in, the, in relation to post-traumatic stress disorder, right, and, in, and mental health conditions, it's important, and to us all, regardless of our health, it's important to us all, I think, that we be cognizant of Mr. Emerson's words that we think about positive things. We surround ourselves with positive people and positive things and positive events and positive energy so that, we may, so that we are positive, so that we're happy. It helps us get through everything. It helps us, it helps to make things better. It, may, it helps you to be that much happier even amidst the most difficult of conditions. Next slide, Brooke. There's Tuesday and I delivering a, a children's presentation at a library not long ago. You might notice there's a service dog with a lady right there on the right-hand side. And there's Tuesday, my service dog there. What can, what people sometimes ask, well, what Tuesday can do? What can, what can Tuesday do? And I will often reply, what can't he do? So what can Tuesday do? It's a good question. Tuesday, it's your time, buddy. Let's see, Tuesday. Turn. Good 
voice it. Oh, what a good puppy. Stay. Look at that face. <laughs> and then if that face doesn't make you, <laughs> you are such a good boy. I love you. Yes. He's like, yeah, but where's my treat, man? <laughs> Tuesday can do all sorts of things. And like other service dogs, he has been trained to perform tasks, meaning he can do things that help me with a particular function. One function, let's see, can I have a volunteer? What's your name, sir? Luke. Hi, I'm Luis. Nice to meet you. Would, Tuesday, Tuesday, back, 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 sit. Yes, yeah, stay. Good boy, stay. Now, Luke, would you come up here with me? Awesome. You're not afraid of Tuesday, are you? Okay, good. Because, I mean, he's like the least... Oh, yeah, yeah. Nice, nice. So Tuesday, so I, well, let's see. I'm going to ask Tuesday. I'm going to, in demonstrating some of the ways that service dogs can help people, I'm going to put a few things on the ground here uh, because one of the ways that Tuesday helps me, Tuesday, come back here. Good boy. Sit. Yeah, stay. I, I, so I threw this, I'm going to throw this pen, it's not sharp, and uh, note cards and this leash here. I, there are three things on the ground. And Luke has offered graciously to help us out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Tuesday to get one of those three things. I don't know what yet. In fact, I'm going to ask Luke to decide what, which of those things to get first. And then I'm going to ask Tuesday to get one of those things and to take it to Luke. And then hopefully Luke will reach down when Tuesday goes to him and grab whatever it is Tuesday takes to him. And then I'll ask Tuesday to come back and we'll keep going until he has gotten all these things. Now why is this important to me and to some people with disabilities? Well, as you see, I have a prosthetic leg, right? My, I have a leg because of the war, I lost the leg, and so I have this prosthetic robotic leg. And it helps me out, and I'm getting used to it. But I can't always wear it. I can't wear it 24-7. So when I am at home, I have to take it off. And I use crutches, and I'll get around in a wheelchair sometimes. But other times, I'll ask Tuesday to get something, because it takes a few minutes to put this thing on. But I'll, so I'll ask Tuesday to get one of these things. And that's helpful. So to, which, what should I ask him to get, Luke? The leash? All right. Tuesday stand? Look, get the leash. Yes, good boy. Take it to Luke. Give. Yes, come here. You can, uh, you can clap if you want. <laughs> yeah. Now, Tuesday knows what a leash is. That word he knows. He doesn't know what the note, he doesn't know the word note card, and he doesn't know the word pen. So just in case you're thinking, oh, well, this is staged. They, they did this. Well, I, I mean, Tuesday, come. <laughs> Stay over here, silly. He's all eager. <laughs> Tuesday, come here. Yes, sit. This isn't staged at all. And in fact, I would be very surprised if Tuesday, Tuesday, sit. If Tuesday didn't act pretty silly pretty soon, which is fine because it makes me laugh. And, and that's perfectly fine. I don't need instantly to have this note card or pen. <laughs> and, and, I, and, and I really don't know Luke very well. I mean, we just kind of met recently. So, so and I didn't tell Luke to tell Tuesday to, to select the leash first. So none of this is all, you know, Tuesday. Yes, watch me. Tuesday. Watch me. Yeah, good boy. He's waiting like a good boy because he knows I'm going to ask him to get one of those things. What should I ask him to get next? The note cards. Tuesday. Look, get the note cards. Uh -uh. Get the note cards, Tuesday. That's it. Get it. Good boy. Look. Get it, Tuesday. Easy. Good boy. Bring it here. Give. Yes. Good boy. Yes. So I pointed to that. And because I trust Tuesday and Tuesday trusts me, I take care of him and he takes care of me. I asked him to do that. Now, I kind of, I gave him a command, but it was more of an ask than an order. 
And I'm grateful for that because there are times when I'm not wearing this leg and it might be hard for me to get these note cards. So now I'm going to ask Tuesday to, to get the leash from Luke. And Luke's going to hold it right there. Tuesday, look, get the leash from Luke. Yes, bring it here. Good boy. Can I switch with you? Can you take this over to, to Luke? Give. Good boy. Give. Yes, come here. <laughs> what a good boy. Come here, side. Side, silly. Over here. <laughs> He's like, but I want a chicken chip. <laughs> okay, there's a chicken chip, you good boy. Nom, nom, jom, nom, nom. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to ask Tuesday to get the pen. Look. This is tricky, right? It's small. It's not easy to get a pen. There he is. Now go take it to Luke. Give Tuesday. Give. Good boy, come here. My goodness, I just love you. You are such a good boy. He got all three things and he took them to Luke and he brought uh, the leash over. Tuesday, would you get the note? That, would you get that? Bring it here. Good boy. Yes, now would you get the pen from Luke? Good, look. <laughs> good boy, get, bring it here. Yes. You got a little slobber. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Tuesday, sit. Would you give Luke a round of applause? Yeah. Stay. Tuesday, thanks for coming. Oh, my God. Oh, gosh, I'll take this. Can I have this one? Yeah. It's kind of bigger. Thank you. Look, Luke gave us a Service Dogs for Heroes, which is a Nantucket Holidays for Heroes program leash. And I had no idea they were bringing it. This is, come on, give it up for Nantucket Holidays for Heroes. Boy! That's great. Okay, so I'm going to put this down. So one of the ways that Tuesday and service dogs can help people, and, and by the way, Tuesday side, service dogs, dogs, they can be of any breed or mixed breeds. So you'll see a service dog that's a golden retriever, and you'll see a service dog that's a German shepherd, and you'll see a service dog that is a, a tiny little, a tiny little, there are service dogs that are tiny that do different things for different people. And that's, and that's beautiful. Right, Tuesday? Tuesday, sit. Sit. Good boy. So Tuesday, one important task that he does for me is to retrieve things from almost anywhere. I can ask him to get anything, almost anything under 30 pounds from almost anywhere. And that's pretty helpful, let me tell you. Now, he also knows some tricks. And, you know, come on, it's fun, right? Uh, now, what's your name? Helen. Helen. Hi, I'm Luis. It's a pleasure to meet you. Sorry, my hands are cold. Um, uh, Helen, would you wave at Tuesday? Tuesday, wave at Helen. Wave. Yes, higher. <laughs> now, I, that, I don't need Tuesday to wave at Helen. It's not a task. It's a trick. But it made her smile, right? And that's kind of fun, right? And what's your name, sir? Jack. Hi, Jack. I'm Luis. Pleased to meet you. I see you're daughter. Are you a... Oh, you're a... Are you an, an explorer? Do they call them explorers here? What do they call them? Future firefighter. Thank you for and and look, that's great. Would you give it up for uh, for our friend here, Jack and Helen? Um, Tuesday, it's Jack, right? Yes. Tuesday, would you say hi to Jack? The cat has his tongue. <laughs> See that? He's a jerk. Jerk. He said, say Jack. <laughs> Good boy. Now, Tuesday, I don't need Tuesday to say hi to Jack. That's more of a trick. But I do sometimes. Tuesday, stand. Speak. 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 Good boy. I, but service dogs are trained to bark on command in case their human may need help. Yeah. So, so we worked on the little voice just because it was fun to do. Tuesday, come. You're good. Good boy, come. Yes. And Tuesday was trained to speak, to bark on command. And that's important. Now, you see this handle on his harness. This is another area. Stay. Stay. I'm going to go around you this time, actually. Stay. So Tuesday's on my left, which, t which often he is. And occasionally, I will hold on to this handle. That helps me balance. Now, Tuesday's 75 pounds, and that's, you know, and he's pretty muscular. So, 
and he has four legs, so he's pretty sturdy. I mean, he's like a, you know, like a table. I mean, you know, sturdier than two legs, and especially one and this leg. So I sometimes hold on to Tuesday for balance. Tuesday, heel. Let's go. Turn. Right turn. And I am pretty certain I won't fall if I hold on to Tuesday's heart because he's 75 pounds. He's low to the ground, which means he is, has a center of mass that's very low. And he's very sturdy. In fact, if I'm on the subway, or when we flew into Boston, and then before we got on the ferry to come here, we took that plane train, you know, at the airports, and you know, and, and, and it was a pretty packed plane train. And I hold on to Tuesday's harness like this, and it was more sturdy than holding on to that pole on the plane train. Because Tuesday's got four legs, and I can just, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. So this is another way that Tuesday helps me. Now your dogs, and most of you have dogs, and God love your dogs. Your dogs, one of the amazing things about dogs, and I mean there are many amazing things, is that they have very powerful senses of smell. I say senses because they don't just have one sense of smell, they have two senses of smell. Dogs. Their sense of, some of their senses are better than ours, but the one that's most powerful, that's the best of them all, is, are their senses of smell. They can smell millions of times what we can smell. And that's one of the reasons why they are so, so important to us. In fact, right now, with our firefighters, with our police, with our Coast Guard, on patrol right now, as we're sitting here, dogs are working, helping to keep us safe, helping to respond to lots of different challenges that come our way. But their senses of smell are really what make them, in particular, most special. As you know, they can, what, what can dogs smell that, might, that, that help us out? Fire? Absolutely. Every day in this country and throughout the world, if you go online and Google every day, dog saves family. Because the dog smelled the smoke before it became a raging fire, and the family was saved because of the dog. Even though the dog wasn't a service dog, even though the dog wasn't specially trained, Dogs are saving people's lives every day, and it's their sense of smell that's their most powerful. What else do dogs smell that help humans out? Any ideas? That's okay. Any ideas? Yes, sir. Well, like if there's a bad guy that you have to run by and you're exploding the Yeah. Yeah, Luke was mentioned. Luke's talking about, he said, yeah, they can smell a bad guy, and they can smell his clothing, and then find the bad guy based off of the odor on the clothing. And absolutely right, they're search and rescue dogs, and, and there are canine units that, right, if a, maybe a felon breaks out of prison, or maybe somebody gets lost in the woods, they'll, find, they'll get a piece of clothing, they'll give it to the dog to smell, and that dog will find a trail that there's no way we would be able to find, because our noses are kind of small and pathetic. <laughs> So yes, what else, what other kinds of odors can dogs smell that might help us? Explosives. Yes, explosives. Bombs, the, the, the things that make up bombs. Right now, in over 100 countries around the world, our U.S. military has dogs that are bomb detection dogs, explosive, explosive detective dogs, keeping us safe, patrolling our borders, patrolling countries, Helping to keep us safe. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, drug detection dogs, narcotics detection dogs. Right. Our police officers every day are fighting all kinds of battles, and and there are lots of drugs out there, and 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 dogs can sniff out those drugs where we can't even come close to smelling that. So it's. Their senses, particularly their senses of smell, are so powerful that they can smell. They're dogs that can smell bones from old animals, old people. 
They call them cadaver dogs or archaeology dogs. There are dogs that can smell uh, algae. Sometimes they're, 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 they're dogs that are trained to work with fish and game wildlife personnel. Even arson detection dogs, right, in the fire, right? If, if, if somebody, let's say some bad person light, lit a building on fire, or, or maybe let's say the fire and police responded to a, a building that went up in, in, in flames, and they needed to fire, they needed to investigate what happened, because they weren't sure whether this was a kitchen fire or if this was somebody bad who lit the fire. Well, there are dogs that will smell for what's called accelerants, meaning, meaning liquids and other materials that would cause a fire to catch quicker, like kerosene and different things. And these dogs will smell, for, smell the, burning, the burned out area and help firefighters and police officers to determine what happened. There are all kinds of dogs out there. There are dogs, I was saying, with the fishing and game and wildlife personnel that detect algae because there are certain waters. I'm not certain that it's a, a, an issue here on, in, in Nantucket, but there are certain waters and lakes where algae, a toxic form of naturally growing plants, could, could cause people to get sick. And there are dogs that go out and they'll smell around the water to make sure the water is safe for people to swim in. There are all kinds of ways that dogs are helping us out. But to move on, uh, so that we get to Q&A, next slide. May there always be an angel by your side. A little philosophy. And next slide. Service dog considerations for first responders. Tuesday, come here. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Um, just in brief, you know, first responders have to deal with so many things. Um, for more information about how, uh, some of the considerations that first responders may, may look to in response, in direct response to someone with a service dog who may need emergency help, you could go to uh, the Ohio State University's website. Uh, Niagara University and also the Ohio Trauma Committee. Those are three sources of information. If, if you're interested in learning more about how first responders in particular would, let's say, help me if I were to fall down and hurt myself and how to deal with a service dog Tuesday if I couldn't help ask the firefighter paramedic for help myself, what they may consider in dealing with Tuesday, right? Because I would be with Tuesday, and they would have to deal with Tuesday, and Tuesday would have to deal with them. So there are those considerations. You can visit those three sources. Um, but really, one of the biggest considerations for first responders as it relates to service dogs is to communicate with people with disabilities in, in a way that's Maybe simple, simple and, and often. You know, sometimes things can happen and we just react. But it's important that we each know what's going on so that the fire and, and, and emergency personnel communicate with the civilians and with civilians communicate with them. It's very important to maintain a dialogue that's open and constant and clear. Last slide, I think. Every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars and to change the world. In spite of the fact that trauma, traumas happen in life, in spite of the fact that a, per, uh, that a person may have PTSD, um, healing and happiness are indeed possible. They're possible if we keep Miss Tubman's uh, thoughts in mind. I think that's the last slide, right? Oh, there's the happy photo of, of, of Tuesday and I embracing. Um, so we want to go to questions and answers that you may have. 
and there is a microphone in case you want to do that. Anything regarding post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, uh, service dogs, please feel free. I was just wondering what kind of support they had for you while you were on Iraq and on the, you know, on the ground. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was in the military for 24 years and I heard a lot about talk about post-traumatic stress right after Vietnam and I know the Army was committed to putting programs in place but I didn't see a lot of forward movement in that, um, especially when we were deployed as flight nurses. Um, so I was just wondering if they had support for you on the ground how they responded, or if you felt like when you were beginning to have some symptoms like nightmares, did you have someone to talk to? Um. Thank you for asking that question. What she asked, just to reiterate, is, is she asked about, and thank you for your service, she spent 24 years in, in the service, uh, and, 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 um, and she asked about what sort of services and support were available to us in the military and while we were deployed, while we were in combat. Thing, that's an interesting question on numerous levels, but you know it has evolved at, as things do. When I was in when I was in Iraq in 2003 and four, and then five and six, these resources were limited. And in fact, one of the amazing reasons why organizations like Nantucket Holidays for Heroes is uh, is so important, so important because we all haven't gotten this, the same support. You know, you ask one veteran, one family member, what sort of support they've gotten, and it totally differs from the sort of support that another veteran. It varies from year to year, from place to place, from unit to unit, from conflict to conflict, from era to era. Uh, we have a long way to go with regard to providing services, which is part of the reason why uh, or great organizations like Holidays for Heroes are so important and exist now. Uh, why this new Service Dogs for Heroes program is so important and just began recently. Uh, that's not to say that there haven't been resources and there hasn't been some support. But for a long time, including to the present, um, government and the private sector have uh, haven't provided the sort of sources, resources and support that are needed, that are really needed. Um, uh, so progress has been made. I had, a ter I had almost no sources when I was over there. I mean, and you know, part of the reason why Tuesday and I do this is because there, for, every, for every veteran, and there are uh, like six or eight of us here and their families are here. This, you know, for every for every person that's here, there are tens of thousands who can't be here, who would love to be here, but who can't be here because they're mired, because they're dealing with difficult situations, and because there aren't the resources that are needed. All the more reason why your questions are are so uh, important, and and organizations, these organizations are so um, amazing. Yes? How did you come up with the name Tuesday? She asked one of the most frequent questions, and it's so, it always brings a smile to my face because it's just, it's about my boy. So she asked about, two, how did Tuesday come, how did I come up with his name? I can take no credit for his name. I did not come up with his name, and I probably, I'm not that clever to come up with such a, nice, a fun name. But to give you an answer of how he got his name, and it's still a bit of a mystery. Some warm person, man or woman, woman, we don't know, gave money to an organization that trained Tuesday. And that person was asked if he or she would like to name one of the dogs in his litter and said, yes, please name that one Tuesday. Without any explanation, he wasn't born on a Tuesday and his siblings are not, his brothers and sisters are not Thursday, Friday, Saturday. <laughs> uh, so we don't really know why his name is Tuesday, other than what I just said. But we wish everybody, excuse me, every Tuesday a happy Tuesday. Yes, sir. Wow. 
Can you? Uh, I can't even. Uh, that's so moving and so beautiful. I can't even really, you know. He he. But he mentioned that his mother said that. That, told him that if, like an arrow. When life pulls you back. It launches you forward. I'm paraphrasing what he said. His mother told to him. I think that's very beautiful and very true. That, that, though challenges happen, though it's difficult to pull that bowstring back so that you can throw that, though it's exhausting even, the result is a forward action, is forward momentum. And I think that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Any other questions or yes, sir? Thank you for. How do you go about that? Yes, sir. It's a great question. He asked, uh, "How available are service dogs for people and for veterans, and and uh, and what's the process?" Well, you know, they're not, the need outweighs the the supply. Uh, the training that it takes it takes, as I said, two years and two months, and that's very time intensive and and labor intensive. Excuse me, and resource intensive. It costs about thirty thousand dollars to train a dog over two years and two months. Um, to partner with someone like myself. The process is, uh, is, is a, you know, it's an application process and there, most organizations that train these amazing dogs have wait lists that are very long. And that doesn't have to happen. Um, with the support of communities like Nantucket, with the support of government, you know, and we need more pressure placed on our government and our leaders to start funding service dogs to help people of all walks um, still to this day and also speaking to the lady's question we still don't have government recognition that service dogs that dogs can help people with um, many disabilities we still don't have that though we have a relationship with dogs that has been more than 40,000 years. And, and I can tell you, and there are hundreds of service dog organizations already partnering service dogs and have for some time. We still don't have government funding. Government, our dollars, our taxpayer dollars being funneled to help service dogs for veterans. That said, the government can't exclusively do it on their own. Because really what we're talking about here, whether it's the government or whether it's the private sector, we're talking about us helping each other. Um, we need these two to work in concert to, to train and partner more service dogs with people uh, because they're life-saving, life-altering. Um, you know, I, I don't think I would be able to, I don't think I would have been able to come here and to be with you and to have healed in the way that I have if it weren't for Tuesday. I wouldn't have been able to come and share time with you and to do what we do in talking to people and, and educating and so on. How can people give? People can give in a myriad of ways. They can give with their time. They can get involved with organizations like here on the island, Nantucket Holidays for Heroes. They can give their skills. You know, some people are administrators. Some people are, are uh, event coordinators. Some people are dog people. Some people, you know, there's, you know, uh, people can give dollars, people can give time, people can give, people can talk to other people. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing that would say that five or eight people here could say, hey, listen, I want to work together. I want to collaborate on, in fact, I think some of the, some of Nantucket's finest here are raising money. Some of the youth here are raising money to fund one dog together in small groups to collect the monies needed to partner, to train and partner a service dog with a veteran. And that's exactly a, an, a, a, an example of how people can help. Yes, yes, sir. Sadly, no. Uh, he asked, does the VA, the VA does not provide service dogs for veterans. Tuesday and I, in 2008 and nine. We and others lobbied hard Congress to 
do just that. And in, in essence, we, the, 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 the Congress passed a law mandating that the VA would conduct a study, which is necessary, to get the scientific evidence needed to say, okay, definitively, service dogs can, can help PTSD, people with PTSD. Sadly, the VA didn't do the study correctly. They, they dropped the ball, and they have continued to drop the ball, and the study is not complete, though it was mandated that they do it in, in, in three years. And that was in 2008, and it's 2016. Yes, exactly. Exactly. They can spend $600 on a toilet seat, you know, but they can't fund a study or they can't outsource a study to a capable, incredible, competent university or, or organization that can do a study that's important. Um, so no, sadly the VA has, has again, dropped the ball on, on taking care of doing its mission, which is to take care of veterans and their families. Um, it is shameful. It's shameful, and we talk about it a lot, not in this, in this, in this forum, but we, you know, we beat our chests uh, about, uh, about the, uh, the, the incompetence uh, and the dishonor that is associated with caring for uh, veterans and their families. Yes, ma'am. That's right. We just met Barbara before this event. Barbara just asked, mentioned this comment about uh, access issues relating to service dogs, that society needs to be better educated and inclusive regarding accepting service dogs into the public, which is our right. And still, to this day, uh, people, all, veterans, non-veterans with service dogs, uh, you know, dealing with one of those effects, right, disassociation, right, feeling disassociated from your, when, when, and I've had it happen to me, and you mentioned a post office in Michigan, and in New York, I had it happen to me where it said exactly that on the, on the, on the front of the post office, it still says, you know, see only guide dogs or only seeing eye dogs, and not service dogs welcome, or service dogs only, or whatever the case may be. It, it, is, it, is, it continues to remain a, a sore um, that even government, let alone the private sector, continues to not be. And, and what we ask people, what another re way that people can get involved is when they see something that's wrong, say something, do something, say listen, I'm sorry, I don't have a service dog, but I'm a citizen, I'm a taxpayer, and I know that that sign on your front door is not right, because there are more than just guide dogs. So you need to, you know, to talk to the manager of the, you know, you need to let me speak with the manager of the post office or the postmaster and say, hey, that sign needs to come down, that sign needs to change. Or, listen, you can't treat that person that way. That person is protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act. Speak up. You have a voice. That's American. It's just so ironic that a government agency like the post office doesn't even know the federal law that says that the dogs in. You have to let a person with a service dog into a hotel and whatnot. Yes, that's right. But you know what? On the, sa on the same notion, we are the government. I mean, I, I try to be, you know, we are the people, and they are of us, and if we really want something to change, we have to, we all know that in our own lives, if we want something to happen, if we want to get good grades, if we want uh, a new piece of clothing, if we want, we have to do something about it. Uh, yes, ma'am.
Oh, well, thanks for your service, by the way, first. Um, uh, are, are you a, uh, w w what position are you with? Uh, Nantucket Police Department. Nantucket Police Department, thank you. I just want to focus in on, because some of this is for the video. And, uh, and she, she asked, this police officer asked a fantastic question. In, in a, she asked a very specific question. If I'm at home, if I'm at, at home, and let's say I lived here on Nantucket, and I was at home, and Tuesday wasn't wearing his vest, which he doesn't wear at home. And I wasn't able to tell the officer that he's my service dog. What would, he, what would she do to help me? Because service dogs, we, we really need to think of service dogs as, in many ways, as you would this leg. Tuesday is an extension of me. He helps me move. He helps me with everything. So in many ways, he is a living piece of my body. And, and to, the, to the officer's question, it's important that he be with me all the time. In the, in the case that she brought up, that's a very tricky situation because I'm... In that situation, I'm not awake. I'm unconscious. Hopefully, there's someone at my home that can say, officer, so, you know, officer, please, uh, you know, this is his service dog. He's going to need this service dog. Please take this service dog or make arrangements to have the service dog transported to the hospital or wherever. Uh, or the officer may maybe she does recognize that he's a service dog that he's a specially trained dog in some way and she may then talk to hopefully somebody who is not unconscious and say listen i understand that that's your service dog and that this relationship is important i want to make sure that somebody can you take can you take care of the service dog while while this person is moved to the hospital or wherever? Can you meet us at the hospital or wherever? It's very important that this dog stay with me as much as possible for his sake and mine. Because honestly, if Tuesday and I are separated, there's something wrong and he knows it. And he won't be happy. He'll be yelping and so on because he knows that something will be wrong. Does that kind of That's a fantastic idea. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a fantastic idea. I, I don't, you know, and that's something that t Tuesday, Tuesday, can we, oh, he wants to say hi. He can say hi here. Um, she mentioned an idea about a, having a, a sticker on a door, on a, on a front door, much like maybe like an alarm sticker, like a Honeywell or, or Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday come. Yes. Well, you know what it is, is when, when people applaud, Applause knows he, Tuesday, come here baby. You all can meet him and say hi in just a minute. Tuesday, I want to get back to the officer. Uh, I want to make sure that, that the situation was answered well though. But I think it is an interesting, I don't want to unilaterally say that that's the solution because here on Nantucket, that may not be the solution. But it's something that you all, sh your community should talk about because maybe it is, maybe it is. Uh, there, are, there are always going to be dissenters, right? They're gonna be, there's going to be somebody out there that's going to say, well, gosh, I don't want to put a sticker on my house because then I have a label that I have a disability. And, then, and they're not going to want that. But... Yeah, there, see, these are the creative ideas and ways that first responders and people with disabilities, you know, these are the, these are the, these are the discussions that are 
fantastic that need to happen that help everyone out. So that's brilliant. And the that's officer could. Is he going to let his, is he, Susie, going to let her hear you? Yes. Is that your question? Mm. That's a very interesting, you know, question because the, you know, uh, you know, there's so many different service dog organizations and schools, and so many different types of service dogs, and so many different manners of alerting that it would almost almost be impossible to discern. Every, you know, to outline every situation. However, um, uh, it, it, I think on a reasonable standard, a given first responder will be able to, un and especially because of your training and your constant association with environments like these, you will be able to, the first responder will be able to find out, will be able to figure out that the animal is in fact alerting you and, and reacting to a, a, a trauma, a pain, and won't react, is acting and not reacting. A, a, a properly trained service dog would never fathom hurting someone like yourself. Because service dogs are not at all trained to protect, I mean, protect in the sense of being aggressive, someone like yourself. That's contrary to what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to ask, tell you, alert, not growl, and so on. Um, however, if someone wasn't a first responder, somebody was a criminal, somebody was a bad person, Tuesday would probably pick that up right away. But he can sense, and these dogs, I, I, you know, it gets to the point where you can't even perfectly answer all of these things. He knows that you're there to help, because he can smell that you're there to help. And also because he has had some training with first responders, knowing that you're a first responder. Um, yes, ma'am. Oh, all right, OK. Uh, let me, we'll come back to you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, she asked about medical expenses, and that's a very good thing. To, we fought with a few other veterans, again, in, in 2010. Uh, if a veteran has a service dog, and this is not perfect by any means, but it's some progress. In 2010, if a if a veteran has a service dog for a physical condition, including a traumatic brain injury, which technically is inside your head, right? It's not a leg. It's inside your head. So it technically is invisible. Then the dog, the service dog, can be covered by the VA through a, a, a health insurance, a veterinary policy. And if anyone has questions, they can contact Holidays for Heroes, and we'll be happy to give them the information needed to, to enroll in that. I kind of joke around and say that Tuesday has better health care than I have. Because Tuesday can go to any health, any veterinarian in the country, and I have to go to the VA. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I really, honestly, there are many great people at the VA. And I have many friends, and I'm thankful for the help and assistance provided by uh, the government. Um, that said, <laughs> he has better health care than I have. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Indeed, and she asked, she mentioned about bracelets as a means of identifying uh, health conditions and or a person with a service dog. And there are quite a number of people with disabilities who do wear 
ID, you know, tags and bracelets and devices, and even some who have information on the harnesses of their dogs that say, in the event of an emergency, can't do this, can't do this, contact this. Um, there are means of doing that. Again, it's it, like I don't wear that. I suppose I could come up with a clever system. I fall into the area personally where I don't want to wear something. I mean, it's kind of silly, right? Because here I am walking around in my life with a prosthetic leg and a service dog. So it's pretty clear to the obvious person that I am disabled. But at the same time, I don't want to project that I am disabled. <laughs> and I don't want to wear, because what would happen, what does happen, and this is a real consideration for people with disabilities, and by the way, there's 65 million Americans with disabilities in this country. That's one in five. One in five Americans are disabled. It gets to the position, it gets to the point where people have rights and they don't want to be labeled, they don't want to be judged based on who they are, their race, their sexual orientation, their gender, anything, or their disability. And so we can get into the situation, and the reason why the law is the way that it is right now is because we don't want to get into a situation where you have to show me your papers, show you the scar letter, where you, you know, where I have to wear something that the government says I need to wear because it, because then it becomes a label and then it becomes, it becomes, it can become an unfair bias. It's a, but like with everything, it's a juggling act, right? There is utility to what you're saying in a wearable, and then there is a detriment. I'm going to be labeled, uh, I'm going to be treated uh, unfairly, or I'm going to be judged, or I'm going to be dismissed from employment, or I'm going to be treated unfairly. So uh, there's no perfect answer for that. It's, it's really an individual thing. Yes, ma'am. That's an interesting question. She, she's, uh, she asked about al allerg allergies to dogs. Um, and she asked in the context of if a person with disabilities has a service dog and starts to develop an allergy to the dog, are there medicines? Yes, that they can take. Yes. An interesting sidebar to your question, however, is, and Tuesday and I have encountered this in our travels. What rights does a person with allerg allergies have in relation to my rights as a person with disabilities and my service dog? And I have to tread lightly with this, right? Because you have to be sensitive to everyone. However, um, there is a lot of baloney out there, as we all know. Um, we've sat on airplanes and we've been in restaurants when someone will say, oh, I'm allergic to dogs. Okay, they may be allergic to dogs, in which case they have the right to be seated elsewhere. Their right doesn't trump my right. That's the law. And it's the right, it's the right way, too. I have to say, though, and I say this straightforwardly, there are a lot of people out there who make these statements, and they're not really allergic. And they do it not with an open heart and an honest spirit. They, they say it because they're pains in the you know what. And, and that's not right. Uh, uh, so, and, and, and people, and, 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 and this isn't, and, and people, business owners and the government and people who are in charge need to recognize which, who has the right of way. Who has the, whose right trumps another. Both people have the right to be in public. But their right doesn't trump my own. They don't have the right to have me off of the airplane or out of the restaurant. Uh, and they also don't have a right to be obnoxious, to cause a scene, and to make someone feel small, because that's the way they are. We'll take two more questions, and then we'll close and, and meet you all uh, uh, in the back or, or wherever. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the veterans we brought up here, the Vietnam veteran, the veterans council for PTSD, and he has a service dog to protect him because he had a, a head injury, mm. and every once in a while he'll go into such tremendous pain, and he 
just falls on the ground and gets in a fetal position, and the dog will protect mm -hmm. him and not let anyone touch him, and it lasts usually one minute to two minutes, and then he's fine again. Yes, there, there are dogs that respond to symptoms or conditions in a protective posture, but it's not a defensive posture. It's not so much an aggressive posture where that dog would attack someone. It's, yeah, well, it's a, yes, it's, a, it's, an, it's an alert and it's a, it's a nurture. Uh, there, is a, there are some misconceptions, and it's a, this is an important subject. There are misconceptions out there that think that, well, a dog, a service dog, might attack someone if, you know, if, if something were to happen. And a properly trained service dog would never do that, would never do that. Their nature and their training is to take care of and to alert, not to defend. I mean, there are dogs that do that, that defend and that even attack, but not service dogs. Because if they were, that line would get blurred. And what's to say that Tuesday, that just as an example, Luke were to come up here and Tuesday were to misperceive Luke's action as aggression and then to attack Luke. So those things are not trained not tolerated at all. In fact, any signs of aggression in the training of a service dog stop that dog from ever being considered a service dog because that's the opposite. These dogs need to go everywhere. These dogs need to, be, to go on planes, on trains, on, in movies and in the opera, and they can't at all exhibit aggression. Otherwise, well, you, have, you would have every right to be afraid and then to tell me Sorry, Luis, you can't come in here. One more question and we'll... Close. Yes, sir. What's Tuesday's favorite thing? Oh, I love that question. What's Tuesday's favorite thing? I'll tell you. His favorite thing... Besides snacks. Besides snacks. <laughs> and that's my favorite thing, too. Uh, his favorite thing is, I think, some of our favorite thing, right? The ball. It doesn't matter if it's a little ball, a golf ball, a tennis ball, a football, a basketball, a ball. Balls and, and dogs and humans are like, <laughs> you know? So a ball, playing ball, favorite. retrieving a ball, he and I, and it's one of my favorite things too, right? Because I enjoy what he enjoys. And so playing ball is probably one of his, and actually I should say maybe a second to that, or maybe in front of that, is to do what he's doing right now, is to connect with people like he's doing right now. His favorite thing is to say hello and to connect. Yeah. Well, we want to thank you all for coming, for participating, for caring. Um, thank you for supporting uh, your community, for, for, for getting involved. We'd like to turn it back over to Miss Lynn Walsh, uh, who is going to make a few comments. Thank you all for coming. Well, speaking of connecting, there's some people in the front row that we need to connect with tonight. Luke, would you like to stand up with your partners and tell us all about your plans for this Saturday and Sunday? Everybody in this room is a dog owner, so everybody in this room has somewhere to be on Saturday and Sunday morning. Saturday and Sunday morning, um, the 13th and the 14th, 8 to, 8 to 10 a.m., there is a, you walk your dog to get a service dog for a veteran that needs one. And, and you pay $50 for your dog, and you get a, le a leash and a doggy treat, a leash like this, and your, treat, your um, dog gets bl a blue buffalo dog, dog treat. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And I have to raise $30,000 for it. Luke and his partners want to raise $30,000 to buy one dog. And they're halfway there. Halfway, all right.
So please, you can please come to the Walk Your Dog event Saturday and Sunday from 8 to 10 a.m. If you can't come to the event, you can make a donation through GoFundMe on the internet. It's all over Facebook right now. There's a, Luke and his partners have a GoFundMe page. You can also make a donation directly to Holidays for Heroes in Luke's name, his team's name. So on Saturday and Sunday at Sanford Farm, walk your dog, save a life, have some fun. What else? <laughs> Tell your friends. Tell your friends. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, thank you guys.